Hello there, you are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with the journalist and author Rachel Sharby and the editor of The Jewish Chronicle, Jake Wallace-Simons. Uh, so let's see what's on some of those front pages and a quick spoiler uh, warning for Strictly fans who have not yet seen the result. You might want to look away for the next minute or so. You have been warned. Uh, the Sunday Telegraph leads with the resignation of the Brexit Minister Lord Frost over disagreements concerning relations with the EU and Northern Ireland. The Sunday Times describes Lord, Fr Lord Frost's departure as indicating a deepening crisis for Boris Johnson. Describing the country as held hostage by the virus, the Sunday Express looks at the conflict between the increasing danger of the Omicron variant and the desire of Tory backbenchers to avoid new restrictions. Well, the Sunday Mirror understands the Prime Minister has been briefed by government scientists that there could be as many as 3,000 people a day going into hospital with the virus in January. According to the Sunday People, by Christmas Day, 50,000 NHS staff could be absent from work because of Omicron. Scotland's Sunday Mail puts that figure at 5,000 in that part of the UK alone. And on a lighter note, uh, here's why we gave that spoiler warning. Uh, the star congratulates this year's winner of Strictly Come Dancing. Uh, and we're joined uh, tonight by Rachel Sharby and uh, Jake uh, Wallace-Simons. Welcome to you both. Lovely to have you both on uh, this evening. Um, let's start with the timing of Lord uh, Frost's resignation. I mean, obviously, uh, the timing today, but, but also uh, the timing not quite uh, soon enough to get into some of the front pages for tomorrow morning. Uh, I notice uh, certainly the Sunday Mail, the Daily Star, the Scotland, Scotland on Sunday as well, haven't managed to get it onto their front pages if they were going to. Uh, many of them holding back, I think, in order to try and get this news on the front page. Uh, Lord Frost says he handed in his resignation a week ago before uh, the North Shropshire by-election defeat of the Conservatives. I wonder whether you think he was trying to stick the knife into Boris Johnson, whether the timing of this suggests it's another uh, knife in Boris Johnson after, uh, well, two or three weeks now of, uh, of issues and scandals for him and his leadership. Uh, Rachel, what do you make of that? Well, whether or not he intended to stick the knife in the knife has definitely been stuck in to Boris Johnson and his leadership. Uh, the Sunday Times is describing this as a, as a crisis, a deepening crisis now engulfing the Prime Minister, as you say, coming days after that, just bodying in, in the Shropshire by-election where, you know, they lost a historic and safe seat in a, in a catastrophic way. So, you know, it does seem that support is just disappearing from Boris Johnson and his leadership. And this resignation is going to be a really, really serious blow. I mean, David Frost is a key ally um, and a key um, player in, in Brexit, of course. Um, I'm not so sure that it is just disagreement over uh, the direction of travel over the government. I suspect, you know, David Frost, one of the architects of Brexit, has realised that, you know, it is a bit of a square peg in a round hole whenever, especially when it comes to um, the no negotiations over the Northern Ireland protocol. And to leave in the middle of those negotiations is also pretty damning just in and of itself. Mm, mm, very interesting. Uh, certainly the, the Times uh, leading uh, with this tomorrow. Frost uh, resigns uh, and the Telegraph. Uh, Frost, the prospect of a winter lockdown as well. Frost quits Cabinet as Johnson considers Christmas uh, lockdown. The implication there that uh, Frost is quitting over this issue, over these COVID issues, rather than anything else. But I wonder, uh, Jake Wallace-Simons, whether it could also have been about Brexit. We certainly know uh, that it was leaked, uh, I think as long as a week ago, that um, senior officials were briefing that perhaps the UK was going to start backing down on its demands uh, for oversight of the Northern Ireland Protocol to be removed from the European Court uh, of Justice. Now, that would uh, have frustrated David Frost, certainly. Do you think it is all about uh, COVID measures and national insurance rises, or do you think there is part of it that is about the direction Brexit was taking? 
I think it's a whole range of things, to be honest. I mean, you, you, you mentioned a few of them there. Uh, there's his reservations about um, the uh, uh, possibility of COVID restrictions coming back. There's his worries about tax hikes and national insurance rises. Uh, and of course, his anxieties about Brexit uh, as well. And also, the, uh, the Sunday Times mentioned his anxieties about the uh, priority given to climate change in government policy. I think if we take all of these things together, what we can see is uh, Lord Frost being an expression of a disgruntlement with Boris by the right wing of his party, the right wing backbenchers. Uh, and that's a serious problem uh, for uh, the Prime Minister because, uh, generally speaking, historically, the right wing of the party has been behind Boris. They've been his supporters. Uh, the left wing of the party have been uh, in opposition to him. Uh, but Boris has done this strange thing that over the as time has gone by since he's been prime minister, he's changed his ideology that we all knew from when he was a journalist from being uh, to, on the libertarian side of things to the authoritarian side. You know, he's, he's come out in favour of vaccine passports. He's become, you know, a, a tax and spend uh, sort of lefty, really. I mean, you've got a tax burden now that's the highest it's been since the 50s. Um, and he's veering towards lockdown um, as opposed to um, you know, standing in favour of freedom also doesn't really correspond with the uh, Boris that people thought they knew. And so he sort of alienated his base, if you like. He's alienated the right of the party and the left of the party didn't like him anyway. And so he's looking very, very isolated tonight. Mm, very interesting. I mean, what you're saying there really picked up on in the Sunday Telegraph, which on its uh, front page, chaos as at number 10 as Brexit negotiator leaves post. Uh, exactly as you were saying, his interventions, Frost's interventions have echoed the views of many Tory backbenchers and his resignation is likely to add fears about the direction uh, of uh, the government. Rachel Shabby, we keep asking the question, what is the tipping point for Boris Johnson uh, as leader? Is this it? I mean, in all truth, the tipping point for Boris Johnson came long before he was prime minister and long before he was leader of the Conservative Party. All of his failings were known and have been known for a long time. The tipping point comes when the Conservatives no longer believe that he is like their golden goose that lays these electoral victories. It's got nothing to do with anything else, not his corruption charges, not his compulsive lying, not his incompetence and the bungling of the pandemic, which has left, you know, such an extraordinary number of people uh, tragically killed and has left our economy recovering slower than any other. <coughs> None of those things matter. What matters to Conservatives is whether Boris Johnson can win them the next election. And the minute that the, the perception is that he can't is the minute that, uh, you know, they will make moves to replace him. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, uh, let's move on to some of, uh, well, what would have been, I think, the front pages of all the papers had it not been for this uh, resignation tonight. Uh, nightmare before Christmas, according to the Sunday uh, Mail. There is, of course, considering Christmas lockdowns on the front of the Sunday Telegraph. Uh, the independent tough measures needed before New Year, the Prime Minister is told. Uh, and the Sunday Express held hostage by the virus. So Omicron... Just these few days now, what a week before Christmas, exactly a week before Christmas. The question now for the government over this weekend as they discuss this and what to do uh, with the limited data they have is whether to go in hard on restrictions just in case and then be able to ease back off those uh, or whether to delay, wait for some data to come in with the huge risk, of course, that they're too late for an overcrowded NHS. Jake wallace Simons. I mean, it is an impossible decision. I'm not going to ask you uh, to, ma to make it, certainly. Uh, but as you consider what we know about Boris Johnson, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to emerge over the next few days? Are we likely to have further restrictions before Christmas? Well, I, I don't have a crystal ball any more than the next man, but it does seem that the winds are blowing in the direction of further uh, restrictions, um, even before Christmas, which is something that we had really hoped uh, was not going to happen. Um, and I think that, you know, things feel different this time, very much so. And we've all been vaccinated once, twice, three times. Uh, more than 20 million people in Britain uh, have had the third jab, and that's been accelerated greatly at the moment. Uh, and if we look at the latest figures from YouGov, we're seeing that whereas in previous lockdowns that, uh, there was overwhelming public support for those measures, now more than 60% of people oppose them. I think there's been a real sea change in the public's attitude towards lockdown, uh, given the fact that we are beginning to see data uh, about Omicron that indicates that it's, it's mild, that, uh, that the death rate uh, has not bounced up 
significantly in uh, South Africa. Um, and uh, and people feel that if we you know, that we know that you know three jabs does give you protection, that's being accelerated. We've had you know, news stories about uh, antiviral pills, which are able to uh, greatly reduce the symptoms of COVID. And people just feel, what's the point? You know, why are the gov why is the government seeking to bring in more and more restrictions when we were told all the time uh, that uh, vaccines were the path out of this mess? And it sort of raises the spectre of a population that is the most vaccinated population on earth, probably at this time, uh, living with the constant threat of lockdowns uh, to cope with uh, variations in the virus, which we all know are gonna happen. I mean, the government really has had a long time to get its ducks in a row in terms of preparing for the variations that are inevitably going to occur. Uh, and measures such as rolling out the, the, the pill that will satisfy, that will sort of uh, cure, or not cure, reduce the symptoms of COVID and the jabs, and perhaps uh, bringing back Nightingale, Nightingale hospitals to increase capacity. Those sorts of things really should have been done by now. I think the public is getting really sick and tired of lockdowns. Yeah, of course. Although the mirror, you know, warning that 3,000 people a day could be in hospital uh, by uh, January, the Times, uh, funnily enough, slightly more on your point, they're saying COVID patients could be treated uh, at home. So huge amounts of data uh, still limited for the government to wade through as it uh, approaches this uh, weekend uh, and its discussions on future restrictions or not before Christmas. Uh, we'll be back coming up as much of the nation ponders changing its Christmas plans. Could the Queen follow suit. We'll be discussing that next. Welcome back. You're watching the press preview. Uh, with me now, Rachel Sharby and uh, Jake Wallace-Simons. Uh, and let's go straight back into uh, our papers this evening uh, with the fact that it's not just all of us who are now looking at our Christmas plans and thinking what's going to be feasible, what's not. The Queen is also looking at her festive plans. Uh, that's according to the Sunday Telegraph. Rachel, tell us a bit more about that. Well, yes, that's right. The Queen is looking at the government guidelines um, with caution. Just before we go into that, I just want to correct something that we went into the break with, because I do think it's important. I'm not a scientist, but I have been following what scientists have been saying about Omicron. And I just want to say that so far, there's absolutely no evidence to suggest uh -huh. that Omicron is a milder, milder variant of COVID. That's just not known. We can't copy paste the experience in Southern Africa onto the UK. And the other thing is that, um, you know, the reason to go into a circuit breaker would be to allow more people to get the booster jab and to prevent the NHS from getting overwhelmed, not least because so many NHS staff are getting sick. Um, it's not the case that the UK has one of the most vaccinated populations in the world either. Plenty of people in the UK are not vaccinated, including in London, which is one of the reasons why London has such a high uh, vaccination uh, infection rate. So I just wanted to come back on those two points. But as you say, the Queen is looking at her um, Christmas plans. Uh, like everyone else, she is having to reappraise, uh, particularly looking at the numbers of people who are due to be invited to celebrate on the day itself. And her aides are suggesting that uh, those plans are now being revised. Mm, absolutely. Uh, we're all used to seeing those images of her going to uh, the Sandringham Church uh, visit. That might not be able uh, to happen. I guess that just shows all of us, doesn't it, Jake Wallace-Simons, that we are going to have to think really sensibly about Christmas just very quickly. That's right. I think that everybody is, is, um, is prepared to do that. Uh, I think that the general mood in the country is that we know quite a lot. I mean, Rachel's right to point out that uh, we don't know everything about this new variant, although I would contest some of the assumptions that she's uh, just made. But that aside, um, I think that everyone knows that, you know, if you've got three jabs, you're better protected than if you've got two. And obviously, if you're unvaccinated, you've got very little protection. Uh, people a lot know of questions. That, that I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to move us on, Jake. I'm sorry because we don't have long to discuss sure. uh, this. A bit of light relief here. Why can't a Spaniard play a Cuban? Asks Aaron Sorkin, the creator of West Wing. This one in the Sunday Times. Talk us through it. Well, it's 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 just one of these debates that keeps rumbling on. And uh, Aaron Sorkin, the creator of the West Wing, uh, has come under criticism because he cast a Spanish actor uh, in the role of a Cuban. Uh, in his latest film, 
Um, and he said that, uh, you know, demands that you have to only have actors playing the same racial background uh, as they actually have uh, is resegregation. And I think there's a lot to be said for that argument. I mean, I think there comes a point where anti-racism sort of goes full circle and becomes sort of racism again, uh, where you're trying to, you know, you're so concerned to think of race first mm. that you begin to put the sorts of demands on people that, that, that the racists did. Right. And so I think that's what he's really...